Property Patriot, you are cleared hot. In this episode of the Aim High Podcast, I welcome Jason Lavender. He's a successful house flipper from Wichita, Kansas. He shares his journey from being a house painter to diving into real estate in 2017. He started flipping houses and later expanded into wholesaling and other strategies. The key takeaways for this episode include the importance of continuous learning, the value of mentorship in real estate, and the shift in focus from quantity to quality in deals for better profitability. This episode is a deep dive into the transformative power of real estate investing and its impact on your personal legacy. For those looking to achieve new heights in real estate, this is where we provide tools to achieve generational wealth in real estate. This is the AMI Podcast, episode 67. Hey, good day, High Flyer, and welcome to the Aim High Podcast. Today, I'm with Jason Lavender. Good afternoon, Jason. How are you today? Good, bud. How you doing, man? Doing great. Hey, listen, man, it's really good meeting you face-to-face, so to speak, or Mm -hmm. audio-to-audio for those who are listening on the... Would you do me a favor and give me a quick introduction, please? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Jason Lavender. I'm in the Wichita, Kansas market, born and raised. I had an interesting career before real estate. It was interesting to me. I was a house painter, so that was my foray into real estate investing. In 2017, I jumped in feet first and started flipping houses and haven't looked back. Awesome, man. You jumped into this around 2017 and just really took off. What got you started? Like many people, maybe reading some books, exposed to some benefits of investing in real estate and quite honestly watching the dumb tv shows my wife and i actually back in in the early 2000s when those shows started popping we almost dove into real estate and <laughs> we were on the fence in 08 and we didn't ultimately do that and it's probably a blessing in disguise and a silver lining but yeah fast forward a few years in 2017 it was my midlife crisis and i was ready to do something else. And so I, I always describe it. It was my get off the ladder moment. I was literally a house painter. I had a good crew and a good company, but I I was on a ladder every day and I wanted to get off the ladder and I knew real estate would allow me to do that and gave me the opportunities. And yeah, like I said, I haven't looked back. Yeah. So 2017, you you started with wholesaling or how did that work? No, I started flipping houses. To me, it was a natural extension. I had a, a painting and remodeling company, and I enjoyed working on houses. I took a very hands-on approach. I bought my first house at an online auction and did most of the work myself, subbed out a little bit, not much. I wanted to learn all the pitfalls and hit all the bumps. So I did that very strategically. And I knew I had my eye on a couple of mentor groups and some coaching programs. And so I wanted to, as I said, learn the, the hard way and feel the pain, so to speak. But no, I started house flipping and bought one, bought a second one before I finished the first one. I'm very much a shoot first, aim later type of of entrepreneur. And yeah, I haven't really haven't changed much up since then. We still flip houses subsequently through those first couple of years, learning how to work an assignment contract and building out a wholesaling company, but scale, learning some creative finance terms and how to structure deals, how to raise private capital, everything. And and they're all tools in my toolbox that we still use today. Thankfully, I've been able to drop the tool belt and I'm no longer working in my business. I just work on it. We've got a great team. But yeah, I I always say this. At the core of it, I'm a house flipper at heart. I love seeing old things fixed up. It's something about my nature. I just I love seeing rehabs. I just got back from walking one of our rehabs and talking with our project manager and I'll never let that go. I know a lot of people scale out of certain positions in their company and that's one that I'll continue to sit firmly in. That man, and listen, flipping is fun. Flipping is fun. Of assets and all that, but the key to all this, no matter what you're doing, if you're re if you're flipping, if you're wholesaling, if you're buying rental properties and burying, it's all the same. You you still got to use the same formulas to figure out what you're going to get and how you're going to fix it up. So now, you mentioned mentorship. You actually signed up for one or did you? Yeah, in 2018, jumped in with Justin Williams. He's out of the game now, but 
to group Bill Allen took over and ran a seven, seven, seven figure flipping. That was instrumental in learning much of the foundation of what I point and implemented. I met Don Costa in 2018 and I've continued to hang in with Don. We've actually got a meet up in Austin, a quarterly mastermind here this week. And so I'll be heading to Austin this week. And Don's been pretty instrumental in just throughout the years, paving the way. He's an OG, a pioneer in the space. And but yeah, I'm a I'm a real estate junkie and a, and I love to learn. And so if there's a seminar, if there's a group, a mastermind, if there's something that I can be a part of to level up and learn and be in the right groups and the right people and the right circles, having the right conversations, I'm always going to be there. Yeah, it. When you stop learning, you start dying. In my mm -hmm. mind, you're gonna you're gonna wither on the grapevine and fall off. That's awesome. Uh, now. Mm -hmm. Your first deal, you bought it on an auction, an online auction site. H how did you source it other than finding it online? But hard money, private money, how did you fund it? Yeah, I always love talking about the first deal. That's something that every investor has in common. And I think it's a, a neat thread. What, you don't want to gloss over some of those first painful lessons that we've learned. And so, yeah, mine was no different. Yeah, I bought it in an online auction. It was Zome.com, X-O-M-E. I'm not even sure if they're still around. It was basically REO properties. And much of the, in my area, much of the bank repossession properties would end up on Zome. It was a hot mess. The online auction systems are, you think that you win the bid, you're not really walking away with the property. So we actually won the bid three times before we yeah. actually closed on the deal. Yeah. They've got all kinds of sneaky stuff that they'll, un you weren't actually the winning bidder, find out you're bidding against other people. When I jumped in, I didn't know anything. I literally knew nothing. I, I used a signature loan in my market. I'm in Wichita, Kansas. So it is a an easy market. The, low, the price points are super low. I talk to people around the country and starter homes are half a million. Forget it. I bought this house for $24,000. It was a little three bed, one bath and needed a lot of work. And that's what I had. I had time to give. So I literally funded it with a signature loan, which I credit. And we funded that through all the materials on a Home Depot card. I worked nights and weekends. I had some of my crew over there helping me here and there, but I had to, you know, continue to keep the lights on. So I kept, I kept our jobs going. And literally this was my foray into real estate. Bought a second house before I even finished that one. And, and like I said, I, I got the bug and uh, I haven't looked back, but did okay on that first one. Learned a, a lot of lessons. And this is something we teach our students. I've got a tremendous amount of less experience through real estate. And you're either, you're going to win or you learn. And I learned a lot. And financial rewards on that one were incredibly high, but that's okay. I was a real estate investor, and uh, that was the the tipping point, and never looked back. And you progressed from there. How many uh, how many flips have you done so far? <laughs> We're over fifty flips, over one hundred and fifty wholesale deals, and so we're yeah we we uh, we try to keep our foot on the gas with our marketing. I run a lot of different meetups. Something that I've I learned early on was networking was key. I can spin myself blue until I'm blue in the face on marketing and they'll get a return on that. But the X factor for me was always networking. And that's been a good, tremendous lead source for us and the meetups and the RIAs that I run and investor clubs. And those have been a tremendous lead source for us. But we try to get 20. It's interesting being in the market in real estate for the last five years or so. It rewarded a lot of mediocre entrepreneurs. And honestly, I, I was a beneficiary of some of those, what the market gave us. And it really allowed us to see some, the last year or so, allowed us to see some of the holes in our business. So we're actually, our 2024 goals are, are much leaner. We want to increase profitability, but I want to do far fewer deals. And we're starting to see that now. So. The volume that we had been accustomed to for a long time, I don't, I don't 
want or need that. And uh, we're going to do far fewer deals and uh, actually become more, be more profitable. Because so for a long time, we were buying skinny deals. And yeah, it, it's like you, you would just buy anything that you could. That the market was so hot, you listed something and you were going to have over asking price offers and waiving inspections and all kinds of stuff. And so we would buy literally anything we, we could get our hands on. And for the most part, it, it did work. Rates have uh, come up and there's not this Midas touch anymore. So guess what? Investors need to be watching their numbers like they always should have been. And uh, that's hence, that's our fewer deals with a greater margins. We're focusing on margins more. Yeah, that's great. I, you could, over the last few years, you could basically just pick something up, throw some paint on it and sell it for 30 more than you bought it. Yeah, hundred percent. And we, that's exactly what we did. Or we'd RTO. We did a lot of land contracts and contract for deeds. And we, there was no exit strategy that we didn't inhabit used. And that's you know, something I love teaching is looking at all the circumstances and your position in your company. There's five exit strategies that we love to teach and not every, there's one of them is going to rise to the top. And so we, we try to follow that cue and, and don't be a one trick pony. And so we'll utilize the different exit strategies based on what the market's going to give us, what the property's going to give us. And quite honestly, which one's going to be optimized monetarily. Yeah, man. Is there one nightmare deal that get about it? What's the one? Always the, the last deal. <laughs> Always the last <laughs> one. Yeah, I'm a perfectionist. Every time we get a project across the finish line, we're, we sit down with our team and our project managers and we really try to hash everything out and, you know, like, what do we need to improve on? I'm, I guess, slightly discontent at heart. And so the last deal is always one that we're trying to improve on. One that steps to mind, though, is I've only been sued one time and it was a small claims court deal. I never do another house in the swimming pool. I did this one with the swimming pool, the writing on the wall. This thing did not go well. I could not get that stupid pool to stop leaking and I should have buried it, honestly. And that was one of my early deals. And uh, yeah, anyway, got a small claims court and ended up buying a, a brand new pool liner for this stupid pool. And that actually, that was the kid's money on that. Thankfully, I've only lost money on two deals. Uh, the other one was a terrible foundation that we did not adequately account for and we lost on that one too, but knock on wood, we try to stick with our numbers and of the terrible deals. They're going to come. You do volume, they're going to come. They're, they're going to pop up out of nowhere. And, but yeah, I would, my advice, they went from swimming pools, right? Man, my first split was a swim. I had a swimming pool. It was absolutely crazy. Seven oh. days. I, I became a pool boy for a full week. Tell me about it. Was, it. it was absolutely amazing. And then we found the oil tank. Yeah. There's always there you one, go. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> the, the stories you can come up with, right? Yeah, so, for sure. For sure. Uh, so you started out with a mentorship program. It propelled you into the future. Now you're starting your own. What else are you doing? What's new? Yeah. So we're doubling down on our mentorship. We started, quite honestly, it was out of this. I don't know if. But it's like, this has been your case, but once you start to achieve some success, people want to know, hey, can I grab a coffee? Bend your mm -hmm. ear, pick your brain. And I was in that camp and I love talking real estate. I love meeting people. I love meeting new people. And I would go to coffee like every single day. We were having, I was having coffee with different people five times a week. Yeah. And it just got exhausting. And so I decided to formalize that into a mentor group and I've had a few different iterations of that. It's been informal for a long stretch of that. And about this time last year, I decided to formalize it and uh, yeah, it's amazing. I love, we had our coaching call today. I've got all, we onboarded five new students and just this past week off a live event that we did. So I just love teaching and I love seeing the, the light bulb go off, the aha moments. And uh, yeah, so I'm addicted to sharing real estate and uh, 
that's exactly what I'm going to be focusing on. We've got good systems and teams in place in our company. And so you, you hate to, you, you're never going to say things are on autopilot, yeah. but they're as close to autopilot as I can get them. And I, I still spend time each week inside of our flipping organization and our wholesaling, but my time and focus is uh, on our students and, and seeing their success. And I've got a mentor, Tom Kroll, and I've, Tom's an amazing guy. And uh, he's opened the floodgates of the potential on uh, what coaching can achieve. And so, yeah, I'm hook, line, and sinker. Now I'm all in on coaching. Awesome. I'll tell you, seeing the finished product when you're flipping a house is awesome. Knowing that it went to contract and somebody else is going to enjoy that property is great. But there is no better feeling than watching that light bulb go on in someone's head and go and watching them get their success, first successful deal or complete their first deal. That's pretty awesome. I'll tell you, bud, what, yeah, I agree completely. But the other thing, the, the huge component that I love is what real estate can bring and how it can change and affect legacies. I didn't grow up with a silver spoon in my mouth. I was a house painter for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. And the people that I, that I talk to day in and day out and week in and week out, you know, they see real estate as something that can deliver them from the position they're in and change their legacy. And that's, that's what I love. I get amped up talking to a single mom that has, has played all the right cards, has saved up their money and is approaching real estate in the traditional sense of, I'm going to put 20% down. I'm going to play the smart. This is what I was told. And this is what I learned. Hang on a second. Let's peel back, you know, that facade and let's break it down and and I can, we can truly help you. You don't have to play it so conservative and so safe like that. And, but yeah, just shifting legacies. And that's something that we do. I had an onboarding call Friday and that's one thing we do is I mean, I make everybody set some legacy goals because, and not, and, and, and I always teach, I don't want to set just a financial legacy goal. That's fine. I'm a firm believer that if you set some goals that are going to matter that at the end of the day on your deathbed, you're going to, you're going to say a lot of things. And it usually is not, I wish I had made more money or worked harder, but if you attach mm -hmm. much of what you do throughout your to things, people, and experiences, the finances will take care of themselves. So for instance, one of my goal now is, as I've shifted is 50, I'm going to visit 50 countries in five years. And I know we're well on our way there. We just got back from our most recent trip to Rome. I know that if I am visiting my 50 countries in five years, the finances are going to be taking care of themselves. So I'm chasing that goal, not a monetary goal. It could feel hollow at the end, and they often do. So yeah, I love seeing the legacies shifted. Not only the light bulb to go off, but the legacy shifted. People seeing what real estate can do for themselves, for their family, for their kids. I've got students that are, they're doing, they're strictly in real estate to help put their kids through college or help a dying die with dignity and grace and know that they've got a long road ahead of them. Things like that. That's, to me, that's what matters. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, I'm all about it. You know, that, uh, that's awesome. Listen, I'm going to ask you the one thing you, as your wealth increased, but I think I just heard it. Yeah. People are what matters. As, as, as great as financial gain can be, I think we're all given purpose in our life. And unfortunately, a lot of us will chase something that's always going to be fleeting and always going to be just out of grasp. But yeah, if you can understand your purpose and live a little bit, not a little bit, live beyond what monetarily you think is at the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you're going to be far more fulfilled. And it took me a long time to learn that. And honestly, I drank the Kool-Aid like a lot of people do. And just bottom line, everything had a monetary attachment to it, but yeah, I'd, I'd rather live for experiences and time with friends than anything. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So let's, 
Let's go into the soaring four. These are the same four questions that I ask every guest that can help someone who is just starting out achieve new heights. The first one is what keeps you motivated? So as I shared, what can now students and then this goal in the back of my head, I'm traveling to 50 countries in five years. We're 13 countries in and I've got three and a half years left. That is my, my, what's written on my mirror. That's my goal. Outstanding. And 30 and three already, is that, or 30 and two with three years remaining? 13. No, we're 13 in. 13. Okay. I misheard. 13 in. Yeah. So I'm a little behind, but we'll we'll catch up. (laughs) I'm going to get the peanut butter out of my ears. All right. (laughs) What is one thing you learned that completely changed your mindset? The compound effect. All things daily will change your, your life exponentially. Make the mistake sometimes of thinking in grandiose terms, but just do the little things consistently. Yeah. What tools do you use? The who not how kit for me. So as far as like software and tools and stuff, I'm on a computer right now, barely on my computer. It is people. People, my team keeps me on track. I would be lost without my team, literally. Awesome. And then what is one thing, if anything, that you would change if you had to start over? It's, it was painful as some of the lessons I learned. I wouldn't be the person and the investor that today had I not learned those lessons. So while I would have loved to have not gotten sued and while I would love to have not lost money on deals or optimized deals more effectively, quite honestly, I wouldn't change anything about the lessons I've learned in my business. Probably one thing I would say what I would change is not putting good people in place earlier on. I was a solopreneur all the way through, and I had the mindset that I, if I wanted it done, I was going to do it myself. I was the only one that could do it. If all those cliches is sadly sad to say, I was living those out. And so, if I could change one thing, I would have put my team in place much sooner. Awesome. And Jason, if somebody wanted to reach out to you, how would they do that? The best place is jasonlavender.ai. It's just our website. They can find out everything that we're doing and all our social media stuff and find out about our coaching and everything you need to know. So jasonlavender.ai. All right. Jason Lavender, thank you very much for your time. I really do appreciate you being on today and I will talk to you soon. Thanks, bud. Appreciate it. Thanks for being a part of the Aim High community. Your support drives us to create valuable content, and we can't wait to see your success stories in real estate investing. Till next time, Aim High, never stop learning. Bud Evans, signing off. We'll see you soon.